Welcome to Services Marketing, Flip Classroom, Digital Recordings, whatever it is you want to call them. These are the substitutions for me standing in a lecture theatre monologuing at you. You instead have me sitting at my laptop monologuing at you. Today's lecture broadcast is brought to you from the magnificent city of Armadale in New South Wales and from the headquarters of the Travelling Services Marketing Show, we are going to quickly run you through a couple of housekeeping. Uh, probably going to repeat this on most of the early lectures. This is pre-recorded content. Obviously, as a pre-recorded content piece, your opportunities to interact are limited, but not entirely out of the question. There are ways and means. This is going to be an asset that you can use for self-directed learning. Your co-creation of your services marketing subject experience can come through just the consumption of these slide decks and their accompanying videos. But what I'd suggest that in the first case of if in doubt, check with the textbook. Uh, if still in doubt, contact me. I'm more than happy for you to open with contacting me. I encourage students to send me their questions in writing, in email, uh, for three reasons. First, the writing of the question itself sometimes produces the answer as you're typing out that what it is you want to know or what you want clarified the process of formulating your ideas into the email results in self-directed self-discovery. Secondly, email is really useful for me as a system check of if I'm starting to receive a number of questions around the same piece of content, I know to go back and reiterate on that content, to focus on it, and also I know that future content around that sort of topic area may need to be improved. So it's feedback and feed forward for me. And thirdly, an email is a trail. It's a document trail so that if you've asked me a really good question about an area you're uncertain about, you've got that in writing now that you can go back to. If you find the uncertainty returns, if you're uh, you, if you come and see me face to face, you may walk out of the office going, yeah, I know that. Be down the end of the corridor going, yeah, I don't know that anymore. But in writing, you can go back over it at your own pace, reiterate, cross-check, and seek further clarification at any time. These slides are a substitute for the lecture. They will not replace uh, the experiential learning that will come from being inside the classroom and doing the class-based environment and class-based events. We are putting on a number of activities, events and face-to-face -face, uh, outcomes in services marketing this year to see what we can do to maximize the experiential-based learning but also the whole idea of service as a lived, live, theoretical framework, running the in-class experiences, it's being done to help you embody physically the theory whilst you're learning about it. So you can go through the subject, you can do the whole thing without coming to any of the face-to-face -face class sessions, and I respect that. And this is why I'm built these slide decks is to ensure that you can work with us even in remote because self-service technology and co-creation are fundamental principles of services marketing and if we can't deliver it to you in digital then the theory doesn't work and the subject falls down so we're really keen to give you the opportunity to do this face-to-face -face, remote or both now, the standard uh, session objectives. This is the services marketing ethics recap. We're going to talk about what 
elements are what are the concerns, frameworks, and issues that we're going to encounter as services marketers in terms of both our understanding of marketing ethics, but also the nature of the services marketing product as the intangible means it's really hard to bring back the unused portion of the experience. You can get to the week 12 and go, you know what, I didn't go to class in weeks eight and nine. I'd like to bring back those four hours and get a refund. Or I'd like to trade it, exchange it. You know, this this uh, conceptual theoretical framework you provided for me, this way of thinking doesn't fit. I'd like to swap it for something a little broader, maybe uh, kind of metrics. So since we can't do some of these things that we're used to doing in other aspects of marketing, it raises a few interesting ethical scenarios. So this is the shopping list of everything you could possibly do suspect or ethically, morally, um, considerably gray. But these are just like, uh, oh, in many aspects, these are just broad ethical issues. A couple of things in services marketing uh, that we do encounter is because a service is a subjective experience, it's possible to have a really good service and then not, or uh, basically if you're doing a, say, pay by success or pay by outcome, you could have a good outcome and then go and pretend your honesty would be an issue. Uh, services providers have to have a lot of uh, challenges and we come across this when we go into the things around service provision and cut and employee roles in service provision. You are often in positions of trust. You're in positions of interpersonal contact face to face you are going to put yourself into scenarios and environments where your honesty and your integrity becomes important. Uh, other issues that spring to mind really predominantly in services marketing is when we start to use segmentation, we're going to be using segmentation on people quite often to the face, to them, directly. And so things like discrimination by age, by race, by sex, by a uh, gender presentation, by assumed sexual orientation, by assumed religious affiliation, by assumed political affiliation. Management may reserve the right to refuse, but management also reserves the right to get themselves absolutely punched in the face by a lawyer. It is a challenge. Because in segmentation, particularly in the subduction model, we see this concept of the other customer and who is the ideal other customer for us to present to our markets. Also in that is the question of what is our moral obligation to that other customer if we're presenting them as part of the service package. Welcome board, come to this subject. Hi, we've recruited you because you have a certain set of traits, you're super studious, you do all the readings and you like to participate in class. So we've recruited you into the subject to co-teach it by your experience. And we've also recruited a whole bunch of people just to sit in the corner and go, okay, I'm taking down notes from you. Now, on one side, that might be the perfect other customer because we have just recruited for you an audience and you are a performer and now you have a stage to work on and an audience to work with, you are having the best subject of your life. At the other end of the spectrum is if we have done this, um, recruited you in because your participatory approach is going to improve the educational experience of the other people in the room, but you're going to not experience the participatory approach of hearing their views, then we have an ethical consideration of what are we doing in terms of using you as the other customer or as part of the product. We also have areas uh, in terms of pricing, the subjectivity of experience. So it is a consideration. Uh, and the ones that the five really important ones for me, uh, 
teaching this subject and teaching you to be ethical and moral social marketers comes with the understanding that when I present a worldview, it is not a, a it's not compulsory. It may not be a standard issue. It is a worldview that I hold that if you find value in it and you find value in adopting parts or all of it, may it serve you well. But it is not a compulsion that you must become as I am. Not least of which is the world probably um, would have some questions to ask me about the ethics of, of making mandatory follow the lecturer's ethics courses. But a couple of key ethical considerations. As a service provider, you can you have customers in positions of vulnerability as a feature of service provision. If you are a hairdresser, the person sitting in the chair has entrusted themselves to you. If you're a physician, if you are a dentist, if you are a masseuse, a physiotherapist, you are physically engaging with the body of the customer who has entrusted themselves, their physical well-being, their sense of safety and well, well, their health to you physically. So you've created a physical vulnerability. We can also look across there and see well, there are going to be social vulnerabilities. Uh, there are going to be power differentials. We as service providers know more of the product no more of the service and are in a position that we could do things, we could take advantage of our consumers lack of knowledge. We could provide them the second best and charge them for the best. We could, we also then have uh, some challenges in terms of the ethics of our customer performance and we'll deal with this so we're going to deal with a couple of these at the conceptual level. So, you know, the consumer vulnerability. I have no way of knowing when my dentist says to me, oh, look, you'll need a thousand dollars worth of work done on that tooth. I can go to two other dentists and see if I can get a quote and, you know, wander around and have three rounds of people drilling holes in my mouth and poking my face with x-rays until I get a price I'm happy with. And it's like, oh, it's fine, mate. Or... I can trust them. I have no way of judging the service quality other than, particularly when the dentist says, yeah, your teeth will probably still hurt afterwards. It's like, how do you then know that good things have happened? So the vulnerability is not just in, like there is the element of physical vulnerability, there's the element of psychosocial vulnerability, uh, the aspects of where as a service provider, uh, you end up, particularly if you're a, a working into uh, hospitality environments, you're working in uh, working in a bar, accidentally becoming someone's um, seven dollars a drink psychoanalyst. As the consumer becomes increasingly intoxicated, they are becoming increasingly vulnerable. You have a legal responsibility to the individual in terms of service and service provision, but you also have the ethical responsibility of not taking advantage of a customer that you know that you have introduced into a vulnerable state. So there are some, but at the same time, whilst you have introduced this customer to a vulnerable state and they have entrusted themselves to you, and if they say something like, well, Provide me with a uh, you know, provide me with a good experience. They give you the uh, what on the surface would look like consent to uh, the use of your skills to sell them the more expensive stuff, the better quality stuff. If you've done, if you have contributed to their inhibited state or their decision making state, you've created the vulnerability, which is a tension in the job role. Your job is to sell alcohol to people. You're a bartender. The more, the better you are at your job, the more likely they are to make their next set of decisions under less than ideal decision-making circumstances. But also, they're doing it in a state of trust, commitment, and reciprocity. They're trusting you for uh, your expertise, 
and in return they're providing you with uh, you know cash payment money and a continued job so there are no clean answers in many of these respects there are decisions there are choices that you'll make the other so some of these will raise along the way through uh, one of the big ethical considerations that comes to mind for me is in the area of pricing and this is actually possibly in the opposite way you might be expecting now is the ethics of low pricing the ethics of not creating an environment of to which the customer feels that they're getting the best value because the price that will make the customer feel, I've had a really amazing experience because I've spent so much money, it had to have been good, is a challenge to be able to go and say, well, okay, this is actually, we're doing the right thing here by charging $10,000 for, you know, we're going to give exclusive access to a location. Costs involved in the exclusive access don't come up to more than like $1,000 worth of tent venue and everything else but we've charged ten thousand dollars and that person gets the bragging rights of the biggest and best 16th birthday party in the whole of canberra have we ripped them off or have we given them value it's open slather particularly when we get into starting doing things around luxury goods and luxury services and prestige pricing there's a lot of stuff we don't have clean answers for but we have a lot of questions around so we'll raise them up on the way but the biggest thing i want you to understand about ethics is it's an ever-present aspect of services because of the nature of what we do we deal with the intangible we deal with the inseparable customers are at the point of production and consumption they are less experienced in the process than we are as the providers they are in positions of vulnerability. We have power dynamic over them, whilst they also have power dynamic over us as the paying customer with the, with the customer's always right mindset, which is not a strictly true worldview. So there's a lot of conflicted domains and being ethical inside a service provision also at some points in time will clash with the needs of the customer because an ethical provision of uh, service may not be what the customer is wanting. The customer may be, uh, and one of the biggest ethical challenges we will face as, again, services marketers is the segmentation of our audience. Who is it who has access to our service? Who is it who we reject from our service? And who is it that we sell on as a factor of our service to the other customers. So it's a complex area and we're going to deal with it. The chapter gives you some good starting points. You are going to need to resolve your own moral code against your own fiscal code. Um, there are codes of conduct, there are statements of honour, there are ways in which we conduct ourselves as people. All of those will be facets. During the course of the semester where an ethics question comes up, you are not obligated to bat for the devil. You are not required to be, let me be the devil's advocate, because frankly, Chad, the devil's advocate role is a very specific role, and Diabolus Advocus is one that I play because it's a role that the church uses as an argument strengthener. So if you want to come into an ethics situation and say, as the devil's advocate, I will expect you to be a proper devil's advocate. I will expect it to be the high skill based. My role is to improve the arguments. My role is not to argue against. My role is to ensure that the argument in favor is, as be is the best argument it can be. The devil's advocate role is a service. It's a service performed in the Catholic Church during the canonization of saints. It is the task of an individual to ensure the devil's advocate. Their role is to go through the angel's advocate, the saint's advocate's materials to make certain they are the best arguments that they can be, that there is nothing, there's no flaw overlooked, nothing missed for the purpose of strengthening the overall outcome. They're not oppositional roles, they are supportive roles. 
So it's an important service, it's a key service, it's a service that I will expect to be done properly. Anytime an ethics comes up, if someone's gonna say, you're advocating for, you're gonna go devil's advocate, I will go saint's advocate and you will need to be good at what you do. Services are important, ethics are important, roles matter. So we mentioned what ethics areas can be, but basically moral ethics and moral business, look, we're in late stage capitalism. There is no such thing as ethical consumption under late stage capitalism, but there sure as heck is, sure as hell, sure as heaven, sure as all the other the planes and domains, including Midgard. The ethics of business, there are ways to be unethical. It's tougher to be completely ethical. The good place has already shown us that. But reality is there are ways in which you can do bad, you can do wrong, and you can do evil. We saw that as a separate add-on pack. If you want to ask DLC, we can talk to you later. Um, but basically, fundamentally, my worldview of business ethics is good business and good ethics are parallel because you can, the difference between a marketer and a con artist is a marketer wants their customer to come back. Con artist never wants to see you again. They never want to see their mark twice. A marketer wants to meet the need, wants to satisfy a want, wants there to be value that is created for us as marketers. So there's a sustainability aspect. Um, the profitability means that we can come back and do it again tomorrow. Because there is an ethical question in terms of the delivery of a service or product. So if we do it once, and it did meet the need of the market, and we underpriced, and we didn't make the profit, we didn't survive, we didn't sustain ourselves. We've let the market down. We were solving their problem, and then we stopped making it, we stopped solving it for them because our solution went away. So sustainability as an ethical consideration of how do we ethically and morally meet our requirements in the marketplace to Give people the opportunity to continue experiencing, to continue having access to this solution. Particularly around medical science, but often around things like if you are running a successful venue that forms a social community around it, or rather you run a venue that forms a social community around it, but you don't run it successfully, you've let that community down. Is it ethical to let a community down, to form a community, to build it up, than to betray it by not delivering an ongoing service that they can host the community around. So it's complicated. That's the biggest thing. Is that it's gray areas all the way through. So a quick recap. Uh, basically what we're looking at here is you've got the services. Services is going to be complicated as enough as it is. Services ethics are going to complicate it further. Uh, your code of conduct, your own moral code, your own moral compass will be important. We are a capitalist, consumer-oriented, profit-oriented course, so that is an overarching theoretical, philosophical framework that is present. Work with that, deal with that appropriately in terms of your own codes, your own customs, your own morals, but accept that that is there and it's got something you're going to have to um, explore and examine along the way.